Hey, good afternoon. Um, this is Dr. Tom Knotts, and I wanted to discuss with you today about cognitive brain function and uncognitive response mechanisms and how they work and or hinder the ability for cognitive behavioral change. Um, so I, I'm glad you joined me for this. It's going to be quite informative. And let's go ahead and get right into it. One step to learning how the mind works is understanding the first rule of psychology. The first rule of psychology or counseling is this. The person seeking counsel must want personal change, but they also must see the need for that personal change. The reason is, is many people will get into experiences or be living a life that they really hate um, they won't understand why people react or don't react to them in certain ways. They can't understand why they're happy or unhappy. And so they want to change, but they really don't see a personal need for change. In order for a counseling to be effective or therapy, the person has to recognize the need for the change. And then secondly, they have to personally want that change. For instance, many people that want to change their life that do not see the need for a change and as a result, when they're offered a solution, they will quickly commit to the suggestion to the directives. They, they usually get very excited when they leave the office because they've been offered hope. And being that they've been offered hope, they will have the best of intentions. They will have a belief system that will foster or tenant the aspect that this is going to work or it's going to meet their need or shall we say solve their crisis. But what happens is even though they quickly commit to the suggestions of their counselor or the directives of their therapist, they will not work to the desired outcome or what is termed the end result. End result means you have a plan in place and you have a goal that is set. It should include short-term, mid-term, long-term goals, and then it should have a definitive strategy as to how you're going to effectively reach those goals. It should be reevaluated at the short term mark, which would be usually at the three month mark or the quarter mark, because effective change in behavior always takes at least at least 90 days. It's not until after 30 days that the brain will begin basically complying with what is being done. You see, it is common, very common today, for people to quit therapy before they see the positive change occur. And if you're a counselor or a therapist, you should expect this. And that's why you have to fully explain this to the counselee. A trained counselor knows that resistance will arise. Typically around the uh, ninth day or tenth day of of the person uh, after they've seen the therapist. The brain, the unconscious brain, um, at the, the fifth level of the unconscious will have thoughts that begin arising in the fourth layer where the value and belief systems are located. These conflicting thoughts will begin around the second day, but they will grow in intensity and in varying degrees, rising up around the ninth day into the what we call the fourth layer of the unconscious. And then the thoughts will begin taking root and hold in the second and third layer, you know, the subconscious and the interior aspect of the subconscious to make the person want to quit therapy. And that's why many individuals prior to the second week or the second meeting will already be fostering thoughts that they don't need this or they don't want this any longer that it's not going to work. But here's the thing, it's called therapy because literally therapy is when you join with somebody in order to reach a goal. Therapy is also called psychotherapy. And this is because you can have kidney therapy, you, you know, you, you can have therapy in, in many different varieties. But when it's with the mind and what we call functions of behavior, i.e. primarily to resolve problematic behaviors, beliefs, feelings, uh, many times relationship issues because of underlying causes, 
and or somatic response problems like sensations in the body. Um, it can be where a person has no reason for feeling anxious or, uh, sorry about the outdoor sounds, I, I have thin walls in Florida. But sometimes people will have anxiety or depression or they just have feelings that overcome them and they don't know why. So that's a somatic response and um, means it affects the body even though it initiates itself from the mind. So therapy is where the counselee and the counselor work together for a set period of time or until the person feels confident that they have achieved the desired result. Now, therapy is not a one-time meeting. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be called therapy. Uh, but rather, as I said earlier, it should, should act, actually take at least three months because true and lifelong change begins initiating around the 90 to 100 degree point. That's why when somebody typically is admitted uh, for a drug or alcohol or addiction problem, they keep them for 120 days. The reason for this is that the brain works very slowly with the mind and the body. You are trichotomous. That means you are made up in a body, a mind, and a soul. And in other words, you have a life force, you have a mind, and you have a body. Resistance to therapy occurs whenever it is confronted with an uncomfortable situation that seeks to change what the unconscious mind is familiar with. Let me put that in simple language. When somebody wants to change their life or their lifestyle patterns, the unconscious mind will try to fight against it and keep that change from occurring. What the brain fears most, or the mind, is not knowing something. People don't realize it, but in the first year of life, your brain has visualized um, through all of its sensory glands, uh, sight, sound, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching. Um, it has 50% of the knowledge it will have for the rest of its life in the first year. The second year, it will gain another 25%. By the third year, it'll have an 82.5%. And so it's the deduction of halves and what they call the reasoning deduction of halves of learning. But there are things that the mind will not be familiar with. The brain would rather be with something it's familiar with, no matter how painful or abusive or harmful it is. That's just the truth. So anything that the brain and mind are unfamiliar with in their psychological pyramid, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, the brain will consider it to be an insult, which is injurious to the psyche. In other words, it hurts the psyche. And thence, the brain and mind will work together to guard against it. I use the term brain because brain encompasses the body and the spirit working together or the life force. The pyramid of what we call the foundation and the psyche will have been created in the first six years of the individual's life. That pyramid will know all of the knowns and unknowns. So, for instance, if a person is raised in an abusive situation, they will have developed a psyche that would rather be in an abusive situation because it's familiar with that, rather than being in a situation where they're not abused. I've known people who have been severely abused most of their life, and then they, they find a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse, a partner that's very abusive. When they finally get out of that, because I used to work with the shelters, um, most people that need a competent counselor can't afford it. And so I would volunteer most of my time at the, uh, the shelters to work with individuals. So what would happen is sometimes they would get out, they'd go through therapy, and then they would meet somebody who's actually nice. But they would do something to destroy that relationship because without thinking, in other words, it's not something they're conscious of. Their unconscious mind will do something or initiate something or even create thoughts to cause them to leave because it is more afraid of being with somebody that loves them or cares about them than going back. It would prefer to go back to the one that abuses them because that's where their identity is. So the mind will work to divert focus and interest 
away from the therapy. It will usually do this by creating drama. Have you ever met somebody whose life is like a drama story? They go from one, one crisis to the next. Very little. You know, they have very little mountaintop experiences. They're usually going through the crisis. It's a roller coaster ride. It, it'll do it through histrionics. Um, histrionics is where people act out things. Um, for instance, somebody may do something very small or slight, but because the brain does not want them to change their behavior, the mind and the body working together, it will take and create histrionics or some other psychological abnormality. It can even create abnormalities that are somatic or what we call physically physical distractions. It can be in the form of rash, hives, shingles, flu-like symptoms, autoimmune disorders. Um, I've met people who have developed fibromyalgia. And I, I remember distinctly working with two different individuals who had come from abusive backgrounds. And then when they got out of that and later on got married to a, a spouse that was actually very loving and caring, they did both not knowing each other had developed fibromyalgia. One was a man, one was a woman. And that's where it hurts to be touched. And it's because they did not want to change, to have somebody touch them in a loving manner. The brain could not accept that because it had never been through a proper therapy to release the anxieties, the pain and the trauma, which were lifelong in the early years, to accept and make room to accept somebody that actually cares for them. Sometimes this resistance will manifest in the subconscious with what we'd call obsessive thought patterns or destructive thought patterns. Um, very simply, they'll have thoughts like, you know, I don't need this. And it'll be attached to the emotions, by the way. This is where the mind and the body will work together to make the person stop therapy. It will put feelings to it. And feelings are very powerful and can be used for destructive matter just to keep the person from changing their life into something better. So common thoughts would be, I don't need this. This isn't going to work. This isn't working. They don't understand me. It will never get better. Nobody's been where I've been. Um, you know, it was better the way it was. So how do we get this way? Can't we just overcome this? You see, the di desire for change must influence the 85% of the unconscious mind. Your mind in frontal lobes, the frontal lobe being the first and the second layer of conscious. You have the conscious, the, the subconscious. The unconscious begins in the fourth layer. So your mind is composed in the front where you live of only 15%. And that's called the conscious mind. The conscious mind is only 15%. The unconscious mind is 85%. It is in the unconscious mind that your choices are really made. The unconscious mind is where the behaviors are stored. The response mechanisms are stored. It's like a computer program that is already sophisticated and created to respond and act and even search out certain ways and patterns that will put them back into their behavioral pattern and what they have called common or what they are familiar with. This is why a person can marry an abusive person, get divorced, they'll go and find another one. And they'll always say, well, they weren't like that in the beginning. But you see, it's because they know the two sides and they know how they act. Um, I have heard it so many times that I expect to hear it. People will say, well, there were two sides to my father. There was the kind that where he would be the mayor or the nicest guy everybody thought he was. But behind closed doors, he was a different person. So what they'll do is they'll search out that mayor figure, which is always kind and trusting, but their unconscious mind knows that they're abusive. Okay? So what happens is the positive unknown, in other words, what the unconscious mind knows, will always outweigh uh, the positive unknown will always be outweighed by the known variable. In other words, what a person knows, whether it's abuse, whether it's you put in the blank, they will choose that over something that's unknown every time because they are more. the brain is more afraid of changing its entire life and trusting someone 
than it is of staying in an abusive situation or a destructive life habit. So the only time that the unconscious brain will want to change or will act differently is if it will create a desired result for the benefit of the whole body. The number one primary goal, which outweighs everything else, of the 85% of the unconscious mind is it is there to protect the body to continue life. It protects the life force. Okay? So that tells you why people will stay in an abusive situation even though it's hurting them and it hurts everyone around them. They will practice such habits as destructive habits like overeating, not eating, gambling, any addiction you name, rather than stopping or seeking the change. Because that is what the unconscious mind is familiar with. I've had people say, well, why can't I just use my willpower to change? Well, you can't change something through the sheer force of will, because the will is only 12% of the 15% in the front. You see, that which a person is aware of constitutes 15% of the entire mind. Now, I know I'm being redundant because I've been told that people don't understand what I'm saying. So I'm trying to put this in simplification terms. The 15% of the mind that you're aware of is called the consciousness. The other 85% of the mind is called the unconscious. The unconscious mind controls the behavior. The conscious mind is made up of 12% of the will and what we call 3%, which just fills in what we call the colors of the chart. The will would make up the black and white picture. The colors, which is why it can change, is the other 3%. And that can be smells and feelings and delights and dislikes. So the unconscious mind controls your behavior. It also controls all cognitive and non-cognitive response actions. Now, when you start challenging the borders, the beliefs, the values of the unconscious mind, it will instantly bring up resistance or barriers. This is why a good counselor, therapist, will expect it and anticipate it and create a strategy that will work around it. This is what's called homeostasis. That's why a person that is morbidly obese will not be able to take away those cravings to eat. They may do good for a day or two, but then when they fall off the wagon, they'll eat twice as many calories. It's because the body, the brain, which is the mind and the spirit, will work together to keep them at that level. And it will continue to increase that level. The only way that the unconscious mind will ever be overridden is in a case of extreme duress. For instance, when you're put into a life and death situation, the only time abusers will see the abusee break away is when that person truly, their unconscious mind believes they're going to die if they stay in it. And that is why it has to hit the critical mass point before they will leave that individual. A drug abuser, an overeater, it's not until they've had their heart taken out and put on the table and had to have seven bypasses that they will decide they want to change their eating patterns. So the unconscious mind will only be overridden when it's in a life and death situation. So if the situation is not immediate, it is not life or death, the will will not be able to override it. So let me discuss the response mechanisms within the brain and how they work in cognitive or uncognitive behavioral function. The first line of defense for the uncognitive or what we call the unconscious part of the mind is denial. It will take on the form of denial. Now, denial is not where somebody can look at the truth and say, you know, I just refuse to accept that. True denial is when they are unable to see it. The unconscious part of the brain will not allow the frontal lobes where you live, it won't allow you to see it. This is why a parent 
oftentimes is the last one to recognize when their child is in distress because the denial mechanism is, is successfully put into a place or engaged by the unconscious mind because it is more familiar. It recognizes and knows the patterns of life that its child is in. So it doesn't allow the conscious mind to see the signs and the warnings. So the fifth layer of the brain, which is located back here, will respond to the challenges for behavioral change by initiating what is called denial, first of all. And then if that doesn't work, if somebody can get around the border of denial, the therapist, and let them see the truth, it will then engage what is called the fight or the flight mechanism. In order to protect that behavior, in order to protect that way of life, it will either run from it or it will come at you like a mad dog, literally. I have I actually just yesterday had a person that I confronted with the truth a week ago. And when they came to me uh, yesterday, they didn't want a session. They wanted to tell me off. They said they wanted a session, but for 20-something minutes, I just listened to them tell me off. And finally, I had to hang up on them. And I had told them ahead of time, because I'd analyzed them, that they would not accept my counsel because they were not ready for it. And when I challenged them and made them see the truth, it made their brain so mad that they came at me for 20, 25 minutes before I finally hung up. They then started bomb calling me. I blocked them. They then went into the next phase, which is bomb texting. I blocked them on my phone there. They then went to uh, Messenger. I had to block them and remove them from friends. They made a new account, came at me. For four and a half hours straight, that person's only goal in life was to make me see how wrong I was because their brain was upset that I had showed them the truth. And now they would have to deal with it. So let's get into the flight mechanism, which is what it's commonly referred to. The flight mechanism manifests, or in other words, it makes itself known, typically through separation. In other words, it blocks it out of the mind or it separates from the individual. If you've ever had a person that won't talk about a problem, but rather they'll get up and walk away or just shut down, that is the flight mechanism. Another way that it'll show itself is in depression. It pulls inside, and even though it's anger and it's angry, it pulls it in. And because anger is pulled in, it becomes depression because it's not dealed with, dealt with. And it's incredibly, there are literally positively charged and negatively charged modeling centers. A modeling center, for those of you that don't know, is like a computer storage box or what we call a finger drive. It's where you put a program or memory or data. So it will lock that anger into a modeling center that it creates just for it. But since it's all negative energy, it creates what's called depression. And that's because it has to continually hold it down because if it lets it out, it will explode. All right, separation, depression, sullenness. Now, sullenness is when the anger is to the point of seething and the person, you'll walk in the room and they'll be like looking at you, I can't do the, the look because I'm not in that kind of mood. But if you've ever seen somebody that's sullen, it's because there's a tremendous amount of anger and they don't want to let it out. The unconscious mind does it. The third is poutiness. Um, I really, I have a hard time with people that pout um, and poutiness, one, when somebody goes into a pouty uh, type of response, that'll tell you about the age of when this part of the brain created that component of the hierarchy or Maslow's hierarchy. Poutiness usually comes when that person between the ages of four and five had that aspect of social activity or social awareness or social in-depthness created, okay? So they'll tell you about the age of that person's psyche where that is kept. Um, another response, which is seen but not seen as much, is crying. And most people will say, well, they just didn't get their way. That's why they're crying. 
No, actually crying is the result when the brain down here knows a truth, and it's a very serious truth, but it, and it knows that the upper brain is becoming aware, and it literally weeps. That's why like the sympathetic nervous system, when the body is under duress, I've seen people that will have a tear coming out of one eye, or they'll have sweat pouring out of one armpit. That's the sympathetic nervous system. It'll also create rashes. It'll, it'll create hives. It'll create shingles. It'll, it'll create dryness of mouth, dryness of eyes. Okay? A final way is it will do what's called withdrawal. And that's where it begins pulling in and it activates the fantasy center over here in the brain to where they start creating their own ideas, their own visions, their own what would be or how is it in. And they make in a beautiful lifestyle. Um, in places where individuals are in highly abusive situations, they will withdraw and create fantasy places. You know, I'm Strawberry Shortcake, or I'm Dora the Explorer, or I'm He-Man. Um, you know, they'll get into fantasy comics or fantasy books. And it's a way of escapism. Okay? Why? Because the uncognitive brain does not want to deal with it. It wants to keep things going the way it is. Homeostasis tries to keep the status quo. The brain will choose the flight mechanism if it sees no potential for success. In other words, if it doesn't believe it can win, it will choose the flight mechanism. Okay? Now, the flight mechanism can be experientially trained, which means it happens, it trains the brain to respond that way over time because that's the situation that it's raised in. For instance, if a person is a child and they're raised in a home and they're before the age of six and they know that when the father comes home on Friday night, it's going to be late, he's going to be drunk and he's going to be yelling and hitting their mother. The brain, it will actually not only know the day and the time, but it will memorize at what time of day that person, it, it runs schematics and logistics like a hybrid computer. It will be expecting it. And because the child cannot go out there and fight back to the, the father, it will flight. It will go in there and begin training itself that that's how it copes and responds to that type of abusive situation. And it will begin believing that that's the way, because mother is the example, that's the way a woman is to be treated. Secondly, it will look for those tenets or facets of the father who's like the mayor over here, outside of family, but at home he's abusive. And so it will try to find a man who's nice on the outside to everybody else, but not nice on the inside. Okay? It's an experientially trained or what they call a conditioned response mechanism. It will become tempered, which means like if you temperamental, you take it, get it really hot once you've got it where you want it, and then you stick it, plunge it into ice cold. The tempering happens through what's called detachment disorder, which is one of the dissociative continuums. And tempering means it becomes a permanent part. When that modeling center has filled up because it's happened more than twice, it becomes what's called ritualistic. When it happens more than two times, when it becomes a habit and a pattern. Once that center is filled, it will cause a create what's called a dissociative continuum. Denial will be the first part of it. The second part will be the detachment, where it detaches from the will and it detaches from the emotions. They become ice cold in that area. Now, once it is tempered, it will create what's called a neural response mechanism or disposition. In other words, a preferred neural pathway. If you've ever met somebody who is a habitual liar or a compulsive liar, it's because that was a mechanism trained in them for survival from youth, and the brain will form that neural pathway, which means it will immediately go to that as its first response. So withdrawal or flight is a trained response mechanism. It becomes the neural pathway that is first used for the individual. Psychological withdrawing is a type of separation. So is sullenness. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, they just go to the room or they go to their computer or they go on a walk or, you know, I've, I've seen so many different scenarios. That's a type of separation. 
So is sullenness, where somebody sulks. Depression is anger that is turned inward. It's an unexpressed, unexpressed emotion of rage, anger, and bitterness. It will result in the energy rather than being expressed, which means coming out of the person to being pushed inwards. That is the number one reason people are depressed. Most people don't know that because it's uncognitive. The brain doesn't allow them to know it. So this results in the tempering of the will. When you have somebody who has been raised to where they get beaten or abused or even spoken down to, they will lose the ability to fight back or to defend themselves. That tempering has to happen prior to the age of five in the child's developing mind. And it then becomes a permanent part of the foundation of that individual's psyche, which means that they are not going to, you have to help them to overcome the inability to fight back and to develop the ability to stand up for themselves and or others. Now the fight syndrome, which once again comes from the rear hemisphere, the fifth layer of the brain, it will make itself known by what's called an overtly agitated state. The word overt is proper because it does mean suggestive and also initiated. Um, one aspect of basically an overtly agitated state is yelling at somebody. Where they just begin yelling or get angry for no reason. Shouting. Running off in anger. You know, they just get angry and run out of the room or they slam doors or they throw things. Um, I know people that work in the education system and today they'll see children that just get up and start throwing their desk and other people's desks. That's the fight syndrome. It's an overtly agitated state. Sometimes they will do it through suggestive comments. You know, like you're always like that. Why do you do this? Those are repressed, overtly agitated state responses. They are common ways that the expression of the fight syndrome is manifested or made known. There are eight documented forms of anger listed in psychology. It's called the eight types of anger and how it works out in the individual or how the response mechanism of the individual will use that. Typically, you will find a primary response and then you'll find two, three, or four secondary responses, but usually just two or three, okay? Because there are borders that keep people from going full out. Those borders keep a person from getting too much out of date because the thought of being in jail for life or getting put to death will keep the person from going too far. That's called a restraining dictive within the uncog uncognitive part of the brain. So the fight syndrome, very simply put, is the brain, which is the mind and the body, its primal defense and protection. When you go to change somebody's behavior, the brain will initiate this or the flight. For instance, if you want to find out a person's addiction, take their cigarettes if they're a smoker and see what happens. Try to take away a brownie from a person that's an addictive glutton. Try to take away somebody's ability to go to the track that is a gambler. When they respond with anger or sullenness or depression, you know you have found what we would call the root response mechanism. It doesn't mean it's the root for the disorder, but it means it's the way that that disorder has learned to express itself or respond to being threatened. So <clears throat> the fight syndrome can also be developed, trained, and conditioned. Um, this can happen, and it does happen, just like with the flight system, without the major caregiver's awareness. And that happens through repetitive action, which is why it's called ritual. It happens, once again, prior to the age of five, in the child's early years of development. So what happens where the child is raised will mold the child's mind and condition it as to how it will receive, respond, and express itself. 
Okay? So conditioning of the fight syndrome will result in the unconscious mind's engagement, whether at home or social activities. It will have varying degrees as to how it will respond. In the home, it may slap the other person around or hit them. It may call them dirty names or follow them to the door when they try to get away and continue. But out in public, it may just smile at them with a very evil smile because it represses it. Because it, you know, I'll get you when nobody else is around type of deal. Or it may be strange behavior where, you know, I, I remember when I was in Illinois and I would often, because I worked with the state at that time, I would get individuals that were in the prison system for some of the weirdest things. I had a guy in there who basically was arrested because he would go and whiz into the coffee pot at the convenience store where he worked. He did it every day. When they finally, for some reason, the manager decided to look at some of the footage, he seen this guy come in, immediately take the coffee pots in the back, whiz them, and dump them in the coffee machine. He had him arrested. He rightly should have. It's called strange anger. So there are eight types of anger. It is the primary means of defense and protection. You say, well, why would a guy whiz in a coffee pot? Because he hated his job and he hated the people he was running into. And the ones he really hated were coffee drinkers. So he found a way to taint their food as a way of striking back. It's called strange anger. Okay, they have out, acted out anger. There's eight types. Acted out would be where they slam the door. Okay. So the child is molded. Conditioning can happen. The behavior will temper the child's will. In other words, the behavior that they've been trained, how they respond, will temper the child's will. And that means it will solidify it so that it will become the number one way that they respond when challenged. In the fight syndrome, it will cause a reduction in what's called the fear mechanism. Okay? It will cause a reduction in the fear mechanism. I know a person who has no fear. And that's because as a child, they were made to, uh, I mean, they, the abuse was unreal. They told me about how they were put in a well with another kid. And uh, snakes were then dropped in. They'd also been trained to defend others by having to defend their sisters or, and, um, you know, fighting cages with wild animals. They had no fear of anything. Matter of fact, their motto was win, lose, or draw. Let's do this. They liked the idea of getting it on aggressively. So the fear mechanism will be reduced while simultaneously it will develop what's called the primitive aggressor's position. The primitive aggressor position means they will just basically like a, a caveman or an animal come at you. And, you know, I, I literally knew a husband who was afraid of his wife. And um, rightly so. She would tackle men and just beat the snot out of them. And if you looked at her, she was as nice as could be. But if you pushed her and she snapped, she went nuts. She was unable to control herself. Now, when it is done in a proper way, or not proper, nobody should have this, but when a fear uh, mechanism is removed and somebody has been, shall we say, conditioned in an aggressive fight syndrome, they will be called in the world of sports, and this is a good example, as those that do extreme sports. They will also be called adrenaline junkies. The guy who had been raised fighting animals from birth and, and getting beaten almost every day um, told me that he cliffed off, off a cliff that was 120 feet. Um, he broke in there just to jump off the cliff. He would do things that were life and death. Uh, jumped a motorcycle over a 32-foot cliff. The, the bike, the frame snapped. The motor came out. He flew probably 20 feet through the air before hitting and thought it was fun. Went back and got a car from his brother-in-law and asked him if he could jump the cliff. And the guy let him because he didn't believe he would do it. It bent the car like a pretzel. He was an adrenaline junkie and an extreme sports junkie. That happens because the individual has developed the primitive 
aggressive part. And the extinction process means it makes fear die down and eventually go away. Okay? Now, if that is developed in a negative way, it will create a person that you don't want to be around. It will create a psychopath. It, it, if it is in an unchallenged mode, it will create an a antipersonality disorder that you don't want to be around. For instance, um, sociopathology, psychopathology, narcissism, borderline personality disorder are all because of challenged fight or flight mechanisms. Okay? So... What happens with an adrenaline junkie is it is an unconscious, the person is not aware of it, need to challenge the will. Okay? A need to challenge the will. And they will have a very strong will. You won't tell them what to do. They'll be hard-headed. And they will do whatever they want. They will do it just to prove to you they can do it. All right? And if they can't, they'll die trying. And why is this? Because they need to re-experience the reoccurrence that form this in their youth. Because the brain becomes addicted and so does the body. The body and the mind become addicted, the mind over the experience, the body over the adrenaline and the release of the hormones. You get flooded with hormones and adrenaline when you go through those type of situations. Understanding how these mechanisms work will explain why 85% of all a person's habits and behaviors are uncontrolled by the will. They are controlled by the unconscious mind. So when a person has, um, shall we say, the fight mechanism overly expressed or overly developed through negative experiences, it will be expressed by such actions as bullying. You'll be the, he'll be the kid on the uh, school park or, it's, or, you know, on the playground that's always wanting to find somebody to pick on or her. And or fighting, it'll be the person that just loves to fight. It'll be the psychopath or the antisocial personality, you know, that goes and hurts animals. This is one of the ways that you can tell if a person's developing into be a homicidal uh, psychopath is how they hurt animals in their youth. So it's an unconscious need to reenact situations, whether real or imaginary, because that is what makes them feel alive. They cannot feel alive unless they do something similar to what has happened, even if it's imaginary, because that will re-release hormones and adrenaline. And that's the only time they felt alive is when they got that rush. That is how psychopathies are developed. Hormones, adrenaline have an incredible, incredible molding process in the individual's life. So early childhood events will condition the brain so that it will feel familiar and it will seek out similar circumstances, even if they have to personally create that circumstance. In extreme cases where borderline personality disorder is included, it can cause the person to have antisocial, self-destructive behavior patterns. And in the extreme cases, it will cause them to basically seek out and perform criminal acts. It creates the criminal behavior. And when I would train people to be chaplains for the state of Illinois, they would always come in with a very loving attitude. They loved everybody. And I would tell them, listen, these people are manipulators. They're antisocial. They're in here because they have a criminal background. They have hurt people. They have committed criminal acts. And what they couldn't understand is that these people are great at manipulating. They will win you over so they can manipulate you. you. I would tell them, never let them know your last name. Don't tell them where you live. Don't tell you you have a wife, family, mother, or father, because they will use it against you. And it's because their uncognitive brain, that's all it knows. That's how it feels alive. That's all it wants to do. Now, let's get down to this. When the fight net mechanism is engaged, it will look like the person has lost control of themselves. You know, they'll just say, oh, they're hot-headed, or that's just the way they are, or you better not provoke them. Don't say anything because they'll freak out. But the actual truth is, is they're in complete control. 
The fifth layer of the brain will override. In other words, it will deactivate the frontal lobe where the person's presenting conscious is. And it will give the command initiative. The command initiative tells hormones, adrenaline um, to be released. And it will then give the command to recreate or relive the way it has been trained to respond. What happens is when this, when this does happen is they will have an increased muscle capacity, or, or in other words, they will have, they'll be much stronger than they normally would be. Their mental abilities will speed up. If you ever saw a movie where the person saw everything in slow motion, it's because adrenaline has been released and the hormones. And, and what happens is they are moving so quickly in their thinking that it's like everything is in slow motion to them. They will be faster. They will be stronger. They will be more capable. Um, I had people I worked with in the prison that they had to chain them to their waist, chain them to their feet, and chain them to the, a table that was cemented into the ground, solid steel. And even then they would have two guards and they would say, listen, you cannot be alone with this individual. I remember one person who got up every morning and did 1,200 push-ups and then 1,200 sit-ups. And then, then when he was released, would go to the gym. Person was five foot two, but I am not exaggerating. Their shoulders were out to here and they were like eight or 10 inches thick of solid muscle. They looked like a gorilla. And he was the sweetest, nicest guy. And, and I'm like, okay, he's got a very sweet persona. But there's a reason why they have two guards. He's chained so much and they have two guards in front, two guards behind, and another two guards walking 10 feet behind. He was a very, very dangerous individual. Because when the fifth layer of the brain takes control of the front, they get a surge of adrenaline. They can bust cuffs. I've seen it happen. And they can do things that are not humanly possible any other way. Now, the fight system is designed to guard. And that means not allow behavioral change to happen, something to come in and try to influence the way the unconscious brain works. It will also be designed to maintain. And that means if they have to create an atmosphere where everybody's afraid of them because the brain doesn't know what love is, and it's, a, it's afraid that somebody will love it. They will also protect, and that is where they will express themselves by hurting others, by running away, by fleeing, by, you know, I've read case studies of people going 27 years living in the woods. When a person has the fight syndrome developed, it will become the first response for homeostasis to protect, guard, maintain the homeostasis. And once again, homeostasis means the way the body is, it does not want change. So in very plain language, if the need is apparent, the, in other words, if the need to protect that system is apparent to the individual, the brain will initiate the fight system to protect its existence and its way of life. If an unexpected life-threatening situation occurs, it will then change. But that is very rare because in the overly, overly developed fight mechanism, the person would rather die than change. Okay? They will not be able to control it. The responses that they have will be autonomic, which means they're not aware. It just happens. Now, a person with an overdeveloped fight or flight syn syn syndrome will be highly intuitive. This is one of the ways you can identify them. They will be very skilled at analysis. They won't know it. They'll just automatically be able to read people. They'll walk into a room and they can tell you everything about everybody in there, even though they know none of them. Okay, so in non-life-threatening situations, a person that has an overdeveloped fight mechanism will show themselves or manifest itself by what we'd call acted out aggression or outbursts. Okay, when they get mad, they yell, they raise their voice. In a non-developed individual, it will make itself 
known by degrees of sadness, depression, that's flight, with thoughts of suicide. Suicide is the ultimate way of escaping or catanesis, uh, psychosis, schizophrenic catanesis, where they pull in and they just sit there. You lift their hand up, it stays up. Stick a needle through it, they don't even know it. And what's interesting is it won't bleed either. Think about that. So it'll, it'll manifest itself in varying de degrees or depths of sadness and depression, thoughts of suicide or inflicting harm to self or others. So this can include such actions as running away. You know, they run away from home. They shut down. In other words, they don't talk. They just sit there and don't say a word. Extreme cases is they can withdraw, become completely catatonic. I've seen people go into states where they just sit there and they come back out of it when it feels like it's safe, like a turtle in the shell. So you've gotten a very in-depth understanding now. And I, I did this expletive or explanation to show you how hard it is to change behavior. Willpower cannot do it. But what has to happen is the brain, which is the mind and the body working together, has to gradually take on, has to gradually take on the change. That's why even if you go to, to hypnosis, they don't do a session or 10 sessions and you instantly quit smoking. What they'll do is in the first session, they'll tell you to cut that cigarette pack by half. And then they'll tell you to take those half a cigarette pack that you get to smoke each day and cut the ends off of them. So what they do is it's, it's called ex gradual reduction extinctionism where you gradually reduce the amount of the intake, which then initiates what's called the extinction, and it means it slowly starts cutting down the amount of need. In other words, it's familiarization. Same thing if, you, if you've got a person with extreme spending. In other words, I literally knew a person that came to me, their husband brought to me because the woman would get up in the middle of the night and max out credit cards, apply for new credit cards just to buy stuff. I think it was called the Q channel or something like that. And he said his garage was full of things that they didn't need and they were going broke. So it's called reductionism, where you gradually reduce what has happened to change the behavior slowly and over time. Okay? So this is Dr. Knotts. I, I, I hope you have found this informative and that it's able to help you um, with your own personal life struggles. Um, if you're a counselor, I pray that this helps you to better understand people you're working with and how I've intentionally left out Christianity because I made this just purely psychological. But I'm going to tell you at the end, Jesus Christ can instantly change behavior. It can give you the ability to give and receive love. Jesus Christ is the answer to any problem you've been having. All right, that's Dr. Knotts, and, and I hope I catch you again on the next one. Lord bless you.